As we celebrate women, it is important for us to take our time to reflect on the state of affairs of women around the world. It is true that things are not where they used to be, but things are not where they should be at the moment because a lot of women around the world are still going through pay inequality, sexism, the maternal mortality rate is still very bad, especially in developing countries. And women are still, you know, going through a lot of um, situations like domestic violence and, um, you know, when there is war or any form of um, unrest or conflict, women suffer the most. A lot of governments have not actually put things in place to protect women and to create a safe environment for women to thrive, be it in their career or in different aspects of their lives. And in some countries, um, even in Africa, um, there are no you know, known you know, serious um, punishment for people that abuse women. Um, that are violent against women and I think this is something that you know needs to be done um, we, we have to actually move as women from just you know um, influencing policies to becoming policy makers um, and I think you know we have been denied you know a seat on many tables but I think it's now time for us instead of waiting for us to be called to sit on the tables for us to demand to sit on the tables because I must say that the world the world is missing out on a lot from excluding women from this, you know, certain fears. Because think about it, the world has been run by men for as long as I can remember, and the world has a lot of issues. So women have a lot to offer, and I believe the world is actually, you know, so changing itself by not giving women the opportunity. Uh, if Just take a look at the coronavirus, for instance. Uh, the countries that have been run by women have handled the pandemic better. Countries like New Zealand, Denmark, Taiwan, uh, Germany. If you look at those countries, you'll see that the way the, the pandemic has been managed is it, really amazing. Women out there, uh, I would like to say to you, do not allow the visible and invisible structures created by society or systems to keep you down. Dream big and, and pursue your dreams. Your power is actually in your action. And it's time for us to raise our hands so that we're counted. It's time for us to actually make sure that we're not invisible, that our voices are heard. You know, it's a time for us to actually seize the opportunities that are presented to us and the opportunities that are not presented to us for us to either create them or demand them. Uh, you know, posterity is waiting for us to contribute our uh, ingenuity. And I know that as women, uh, we always actually go the extra mile. And I want to say, don't be good if you can be excellent. And don't be excellent if you can be extraordinary. Be totally amazing. I know that as women, we have the power in us to you know, take this world to a different place than it is right now. And um, as we celebrate women, I want us to um, not just celebrate women, but put things in place to give women the opportunities to um, achieve their full potential. far you have come on your own but never alone through the rain and through the shine here's your moment it's your time to talk and now you see standing in your destiny 100 women growing strong 100 women where you belong you stood tall and now you see you have reached your destiny, woman, woman.
As people of African descent, we offer this land recognition in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions toward decolonization. As people of African descent, we acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us, express deep gratitude to its indigenous peoples, and pledge to honor our dignity and divinity that ultimately connects us all. By Kay Johnson. Welcome to 100 ABC Fireside Chats. 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women is a bold project initiated by co-authors and co-founders, the Honorable Dr. Jean Augustine, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green, and Donna Joan Simmons. Our mission is to celebrate and archive the professional accomplishments of trailblazing black women from all across Canada. The goal is to create an ever-expanding database available for current and future generations via print media, public and private libraries, as well as our website, which is www.100abcwomen.ca. In addition to our fireside chats on topics that matter to all communities, such as education, healthcare, entertainment, creative arts, trade union, and so much more, we offer biannual book launching galas and biannual symposiums. The co authors and co founders would like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for attending today's fireside chat. We now that you will find these sessions educational and inspirational. So sit back, relax, and hear from our brilliant and talented honorees. Good day, everyone. I'm Donna Joan Simmons, co-author, co-founder, and the architect of the 100 ABC Women Project, as well as the executive producer of our Fireside Chats. Special thanks to our incredible technical support team, our moderator and panelists, who are the drivers behind our weekly inspirational conversations. Let me now turn you over to our moderator, who will introduce herself to you, as well as today's topic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nicole Waldron, and what a fabulous Sunday this is. And it is an honor for me to be your host today for the conversation that we are about to have. Some of you know me, some of you who don't know me, but if you don't know me, you know, you do not know that I'm a mental health care advocate, um, especially when it comes to family caregivers. And I'm the host of the Victory Speaks show and podcast. Today, however, I get to be the host of this conversation by 100 ABC Women. And as a 2018 alumni, I am so excited to be part of this sister fraternity, one would say, yes. And so our conversation today is on Black women in the workplace and allyship. And we believe here at 100 ABC Women that this will be a great opportunity to learn about ways we can celebrate, collaborate, and be an ally at the same time. And how can we better support and build each other up? So now you still have time to invite some friends. So send them the YouTube link, send them a link to quickly register because we want to hear from you. If you have a question or a comment, definitely put it in there so that we can you know, try our best with, within the time limits that we have to answer your questions. Now, I'm not gonna delay anymore because I have a phenomenal guest here with me today, Jenny Okonkwo, and she's an award-winning CPA and DEI practitioner. And I'm going to say diversity, equity, and inclusion, because not everybody knows what the acronym means, who is passionate about helping professional women realize their full potential in the workplace. As founder of the Sure Opportunity Personal Branding Program, she has a track record of success in helping women discover their why and develop strategies to stand out from the crowd. As the founder of Black Female Accountants Network, BFAN, she has successfully led 
as a volunteer groups of other passionate and dedicated volunteers to help BFAN members fulfill their leadership and professional development goals to deliver on the network's vision of women's empowerment and creating a legacy for future generations of female finance and business leaders. Okay, somehow, if you're on the webinar, put in the comments and give a warm welcome to Jenny here at the 100 ABC Fireside Chat platform. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Nicole. And I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, where I'm calling in from. Mm -hmm. So the city of Mississauga, the lands which constitute the present day city of Mississauga as being part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron, Wendat and Wyandot nations. And as a settler, I'm greatly privileged and honored for the opportunity to live and work on these lands. I thank you, and I'm so grateful for you for sharing the land acknowledgement today. I'm here sitting in Tacronto, um, Treaty 13, so I'm, I'm always pleased to sit here and I'm looking over at the water. So we're, we're nicely grounded and settled when we think of Tacronto and the waters that um, build and surround this land. So Jenny, let's get into this conversation. Now we're taping this show on, you know, the cusp of International Women's Day. Um, why would you say even in 2023, imagine we're in 2023, why is International Women's Day significant? And why do you think we should even highlight this day for women in this day and age? So I think, Nicole, building on what uh, Patricia Mawa said in the video, um, it's certainly a global day to recognize and celebrate, you know, women and girls' social, economic, cultural and political achievements. And it's also a time to, you know, raise awareness of the progress that's being made towards gender equality and the work remaining to be done. Uh, some stats, uh, Canada uh, information that I was able to uh, find talks to still major gaps uh, within the genders and I'll just uh, cover, a, a, a cover off a, a couple of them. So one of the things it speaks to is the fact that the gender pay gap is still a persistent problem here in Canada despite the existence of the Pay Equity Act and the legislation has been in effect since 1987 but the gender pay gap has only mildly uh, decreased since that time. And so in terms of uh, what that gap is, certainly with racialized women, uh, racialized women earned in 2019, uh, according to the Canadian Centre for Poli Policy Alternatives research, racialized women earned 59 cents for every dollar uh, non-racialized men earned in 2015. And also there is a gap of 87 cents between racialized and non-racialized women. So there's still quite a bit of work to be done. Nevertheless, though, you know, International Women's Day is a day of unity, celebration, reflection, advocacy and action. And it's celebrated in many countries worldwide. You know, I, those stats are so powerful and so interesting because, you know, you're sitting down and you see us moving along as women and one would not even think that that gap still exists because nobody really tells each other what each other is really making. And then as, you know, racialized and non-racialized women, we're not even having that conversation. So this is definitely food for thought. And, you know, when we think of, you know, black as an umbrella to describe, you know, um, being Canadian born immigrants, the Caribbean, and we, we try to, to break down the silos among the groups. Um, what would you have to say to, to us as, as, as Black women being in the workspace and, and being now here? What, what is your take on that? Because you, you sit in many great spaces. So it's funny, Nicole, because that, that's a great question. And, you know, there's so many facets to it. And let's just start off, first of all, by even just recognizing women as a gender. So it was only in 1929 in Canada that women were included in the legislation as persons. In other words, given a legal definition as being a person. So when you think about that, you know, that was less than 100 years ago. It, it is not that long ago. And so now if you bring a layer of intersectionality on top of gender to bring in uh, race and to bring in, you know, 
us as black people in the community, one of the things that is really important to be cognizant of is that Black is, of course, a category that's used in the census. It's used to report on population groups. And so when it's used in that context, it sounds very singular. The interesting thing, though, is that the Black community is by no means uh, a monolith. Yes. And the Black community in its own right is incredibly diverse. And so when you look at look at the research and you look at the Stats Canada data, what it tells you is that just over four in 10 uh, Black Canadians report as being uh, born in Canada, so having Canada as their country of birth. Over half of Black Canadians report as being uh, immigrants, so there is a larger proportion of the Black community that are actually non-Canadian born. And a number of countries such as Jamaica, Haiti, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo. And in the 2021 census, it emerged that Black Canadians were coming and Black newcomers were coming from 125 different countries. And outside of English and French, 450 mother tongues were reported on the census. So when you think about that, there is so much diversity just within the Black community itself. Now, what does that mean? That means that we can be allies to each other in the first instance, as well as when we talk about the definition of ally when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion, which tends to have a bit of a a skew or a bit of a slant to say, uh, now this is an ally from the dominant group, helping marginalised groups. The reality is, in my view, allyship is multifaceted and it can happen uh, on multiple levels. So when we talk about the Black community, you're talking about allyship from a perspective of uniting with each other to, around a common interest to achieve a common goal and then when you talk about allyship in the workplace that is of course somebody uh, who from the dominant group with privilege or even other types of advantage even if it's the same group then helping marginalized underrepresented group help them to achieve professional goals realize professional advancement so it really is multi multi leveled and it can happen internally within our own community as well as outside and how do we get intentional about this allyship because it's you know it's become the word that we were talking about but then it became that word so i think sometimes people are becoming so numb to it this allyship what is this allyship and so you know when we talk about leadership even in this you know social capital how, how can allyship even really work now and even in the workplace when you when you go into that job space, how do you foster allyship and especially as we're talking about International Women's Day and women as a woman, how do we have you know allyship among ourselves allyship among our, our peers and allyship among the men. You know, because it's I think it's different, yeah. you know, am I, am I correct if I, if I hear you right. A hundred percent, you know that you know it can be women and women women and men, women and other genders. It, it's totally multifaceted and it looks different each time. Right. You know, there's not this kind of, this is the one definition of allyship or this is the one way it shows up. There are many different roles that can be played that show that you're an ally and it needs to be action oriented. You know, passive allyship is not allyship. If you see something and you don't say anything or do anything, you're not being an ally. Um, and so what I would say is I'm going to take a couple of examples from uh, Black Female Accountants Network, lovingly known as BFAN, and just what I've seen in the past few years that I've been uh, active in the network is we have essentially uh, experienced allyship in a number of different ways. And the reason why I think it's relevant to the conversation is that BFAN is very much an extension of the workplace. It's a professional network, uh, women CPAs from the community, and everything that we are doing is on a number of levels, enriching and empowering our community, creating a, a legacy for future generations, but making sure that everything that we are doing 
converts to transferable skills that we take back to the workplace to position ourselves for high profile projects, promotions, that type of thing. And so when we when we look at the work that we've done, allyship has shown up in many different forms. Let me give you a couple of examples. So we have newcomers and we have established and we have Canadian born. So even within that network, we're so diverse in terms of our own unique life journeys. Have we just arrived? Have we been here for a number of years? Were we born here? Were, were we educated here? So right. many different intersections. So for those of us who are born here, we are able to demonstrate action-oriented allyship by helping our newcomer sisters understand how to navigate the Canadian way of life because it is because it is so different you know if yeah. you come from uh, a part of Africa or a part of the Caribbean very very different I remember growing up and one of the things that was always said to me when I was growing up in the family household if something happened or if I did something what will, what will they say? What will, what will they say? And this they, this this euphemistic they, like I never I never saw these people in the flesh, but it was always what will they say? There was the big emphasis on the collective and this kind of you know um, group opinion, whereas in this part of the world it's more individual, you know, it's more about I rather than they, and you know these are cultural shifts which are not easy particularly when you, you know, immigrate to a company as a, a country as an adult. So there's allyship with that piece, because of course, it's not just navigating the Canadian way of life in terms of your day to day moving around. It's also navigating the Canadian workplace, which again, is very different. Uh, also, those of us who have already got our Canadian uh, CPA designations, being able to actively support our newcomer sisters who are now pursuing their designations in all types of uh, ways to support them on that journey, as well as career advice, mentoring, ad hoc tips, coffee chats, all of those things are action-oriented allyship to each other. Now, in terms of an example from outside of the community, so we have a phenomenal example, and I absolutely do believe that is what has got BFAN to where it is today. So one of our founding members who was an executive in her firm, she reached out to her boss, who was the president of this professional services firm, very well reputed firm, not of the community, really had, had no connection to what we were trying to do as a network and our vision. But he very kindly agreed that we could use their offices for meeting space at the weekend. Now, what that meant was because we had access to this wonderful space, we could dream bigger and we were able to launch our annual Women in Leadership Summit program, which has helped a number of our members and it was a very transformative experience because they got to see for the first time, for instance, that the big four in, in the accounting space had a black partner, black female partner. Most of them didn't even know that before this summit. So we've had many examples where we've had both the internal action-oriented allyship and the external action-oriented action oriented allyship and that's why I really do very much believe in it as a as a as a process and as a system I mean that was like you you caught me I was trying not to cut you off and you said uh action oriented versus passive allyship I was like where are all my people can, can <laughs> amen because so many people come into these spaces and you know they may agree with us and as we may we may sit around boardrooms we may sit around rooms in our in our workplaces and you may have another woman that that can agree with you or another ally that is not necessarily a woman and but they don't say anything and so you don't you it becomes very passive but it but they still should try to say that they're an ally so that to me and then when you show the example of creating access creating access into spaces, creating access, even I think, even with the internal um, allyship of providing support and mentorship, that you're, those are gems. And, and people, I hope you are listening to what Jenny has to say, because these are ways that we can really share with one another 
how we can really build and foster allyship among ourselves, our peers, and our community, and then some. So as I think about what you're saying and, and where the conversation is, when we talk about tips, so, you know, um, what are the tips you would say for contributing in a group discussion? We're kind of technically in a group discussion right now where you're the only woman in the room. What tips right. do you have for us only women in the room? Great question. And, you know, for many of us in professional spaces, that's not, that's not uncommon. And, you know, I'd like to refer, first of all, before I answer that question directly to a quote from Michelle Obama. And what I would say to everyone on the call is, please, 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 I encourage you to check out YouTube. If you put in the keywords Michelle Obama imposter syndrome, you should find a six minute video that I think she did for some international women's convention event a few years back. It is amazing. It's probably the best six minutes or one of the best six minutes I've invested in, in my own personal training but I'll just give you a, a, a small quote which relates to the contents of that video which she mentioned to someone who was interviewing her on her book becoming book tour where she said and this is a direct quote I have I have been uh, at probably every powerful table that you can think of I've been in non-profits I've been in foundations corporations I've served on corporate boards I've been at G summits. I've sat in the UN. They are not that smart. So that's just, yeah. And, 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 you know, it did make me chuckle. And so the reason why I wanted to just bring that into the conversation is that when, as women, we do find ourselves in those spaces, of course, the first thing in many cases is that we absolutely do get overwhelmed by that imposter syndrome. And Michelle Obama talks about it all the time and saying that she still is, it suffers from it. And there's something that she has to work on. So there are a couple of things that, you know, I would certainly encourage women to do. And the first thing is make sure that you come with relevant data, relevant research points in relation to the topic that's being discussed. So that when you're talking, you're talking from a position of having done that due diligence and Yes, it might sound like you're quoting some hard facts or hard stats, but you know what they say, it's better to start from a solid foundation than, than a foundation that's built on sand. Like that's a really strong kind of opening to, to, to come in with. The other thing I would recommend is ask intelligent questions. So as the conversation is developing, look for those patterns in the conversation and ask intelligent questions and just be really confident to understand no question is a stupid question because one of the things that when I've listened to Michelle Obama and other powerful women talk about imposter syndrome is that nine times out of ten that question that the only woman is asking there's several men around the room who don't who 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 have that question too they just have chosen not to ask it and so it's it's rarely the case that when a question is asked in a group forum that you're the only person who doesn't know the answer it just so happens you're the person who's brave enough to voice the question and so it's it's asking that question with confidence asking intelligent questions um, another tip I would say is understand the business that your organization is in, you know, do the homework, understand the business so that when you're in those forums, you don't feel like a fish out of water. So that's something that, you know, we should all do. Now, one of the common problems or challenges that women have when they're the only in those types of meetings, because However, however you look at it, our voices are not as deep, our voices are not as strong as women compared to men. And so it's very easy for us to get talked over, very easy. And so as women, it's really difficult not to then appear, not sure what, what word you'd, you'd use, but it could appear argumentative because, you, you know, you're, you, you want to finish what 
what you've got to say and you've been cut off and you're being talked over. It looks like someone else is now running with your idea. So one of the things I think we need to remember as women is we are sometimes holding ourselves back when we don't ask for help. So the research shows men do this all the time. They will ask for help and not be ashamed of it. So what do I mean by asking for help? There could be an ally within that group that you can say, okay, I'm going into this meeting. I'm the only woman in this meeting. If you see that I'm getting talked over or cut, would you mind just saying something on my behalf? You know, do not be afraid to look for that support. If you've built relationships in that organization and you have those sort of relationships, use them, use them. And so that ally can come in and say, you know what, that's a really good point that you're making, Bob. Can we just go back to Nicole's point? Because Nicole would just like to finish off. You know, I, I noticed that Nicole was kind of midstream in what she was saying. So could we just hold that thought and just allow Nicole to finish? That can be very powerful. That is allyship in action right there. So those are some of the tips I would give. So so good. I, I want to use my favorite word here. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. So good. Like when you said, come with relevant data. And you know, you know, as, as a woman, sometimes you go like, why do I have to keep proving myself? And so I could even hear the younger generation, like, why do we have to keep proving ourselves? Mm. But what you said was building a solid foundation, which made me flip now my thinking that when I come with the data, I'm setting myself up for success, building that strong. hundred percent, hundred percent and the confidence and intelligence, but understanding the business, that's big. And I think women, sometimes we're afraid to ask for help because we think it's going to make us feel weak because we've been trying to prove ourselves for so long. Exactly. What are you saying as well is it's building the allyship, not inside the room, outside of the room. So when you get inside of the room, you have those that will come alongside you. So if you get spoken over, you have somebody who's already there as an ally who respects you and who you respect, who can interject on your behalf when necessary. And I think also sometimes don't be afraid to say, hold on one second. I don't mean to be rude. Um, exactly. What I was saying. Can you just give me one more moment? If you, if you're on a board, I would say, you know, you know, Mr. Or Madam chair or Mr. Or chair, can I have just one more minute to finish my thought? Don't be afraid because I like what Michelle Obama said with the imposter. They are sometimes as not as smart as you think they are. They sometimes even want to ask the question and is glad someone is answering the question. So I, I, those, so good, so, so good. So now in that sense, as we think about, you know, sometimes the interjecting or sharing the information and the data, they may say, oh, she, she's too full of herself or whatever else. How do we then, because you know, let's deal with women for, for a minute here. We sometimes have this way of, we feel like now there's healthy competition, but we always, sometimes we tend to feel mm. like it, it doesn't matter what your race is. Women, when women go into the workspace, we have this competition thing that happens or like, you know, I may be removed from a spot, but how do we not make each other feel like adver adversaries, like less mm. threatened in that space? I think for women, I would really love to hear, how do we make each other feel more comfortable and become like more comrades in the workplace in instead of like, you know, I'm, I'm here mm. and I'm afraid that you're going to take something from me. That's a great question, Nicole. And again, it's one of those things that are so, so multifaceted because I think the approaches that you use may be different depending on what your level or relationship is with that female colleague. So in, in other words, is she a superior? Is she a subordinate? Is she a peer? So it, it's not necessarily a one size fits all. But what I would say in all of those levels and in all of those cases is relationship building is key. And relationship building can happen directly, of course. It can also happen and how can I phrase this? It can also happen indirectly. And so what do I mean by that? You can seek to build a relationship with somebody indirectly by canvassing intel and information and feedback about that person in terms of what makes them tick, what are their trigger points, what are their priorities? 
and you can do that again through networking with other other people within the organization that help you to understand that individual a lot more because a lot of the time what we all find in the workplace is that people's behaviors they're being driven mm. by by you know several factors a lot of them which we may not be aware of so you know i'll give you an example i was speaking to uh, somebody in my network recently where they felt that somebody who was at a higher level than them perhaps felt threatened and they felt that they weren't really getting exposed to the work opportunities that they had been recruited to do. And, you know, we we had a conversation and one of the questions I asked this person who was talking to me about this is, what do you think is what do you think is going on? You know, what what is this person's relationship with their own peers and their own superiors? You know, what what role do they have? You know, what is it maybe about you in your role coming in that might be making them feel threatened? And it was funny just through unpacking this conversation there were things that were uncovered and came to light that this person is now going to go off and explore. So it, it's it's really finding a way of understanding that person, understanding what drives them so that you can optimize the relationship that, that you that you have with them. And you know that also, you know, it's like building a friendship. It's when you're building a friendship, mm -hmm. you get to know other people and, you know, and it's not even about gossiping because, you know, I, I can hear somebody in my head saying, oh, is no, this is not about gossiping. This is not about mm -hmm. trying to figure somebody out for the negative. It's about learning about how we think about how we operate. It's just like, do, do does Jenny like pink flowers or blue flowers? So like when it comes to Jenny's yeah. birthday, am I going to bring you the right color flowers? You know, am I going to call you by, you know, I would even say, you know, th th there's power in the name, right? Yes. How, how, how do you like to be addressed? Do you like to be addressed as doctor? Do you like to dress, you know, by your, your first name, last name? And then there's also gender. So, you know, uh, is it she, yes. her, they, him, you know, so yes. All these different things is what I'm hearing you saying. We have to take the time to get to know, learn about people. And with that, as you approach conversation, it's not from an I point of view, it's from an us. That's what I'm gathering. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's about, you know, you and you, it's about us, not them. And, and we, we come together as a unity. And now you said, you know, there's different levels, you know, so mm. you uh, subordinate, it could be, you know, how do we prevent? Because again, as women, sometimes we may get a little, our knickers in a twist, for lack of a better terminology. How do we prevent um, jealousy and envy when, you know, we may be getting recognized for leading in a role and, you know, from one person to another? How do we deal with that jealousy and envy in the workplace? How do you deal with it? Because I'm sure you come up against it. So, so it, it, absolutely. And, 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 you know, I'm sure, you know, it, it's very commonplace with, with all, all professional women, you know, the discussions that I've had, the conversations that I've had, the mentoring conversations that I've had to navigate certain challenges. And I think it's understanding the culture that we operate in when we're in the workplace and every workspace has a different culture. Some are really evangelical about collaboration and teamwork, some not so much. And then, of course, you've got all the subcultures. So you've got the organizational culture, but then you've got subcultures within departments, lines of business, uh, various functions. So it's understanding what the culture is and really trying to align your behavior to that culture. So when it comes to things like praise and recognition, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I learned from a previous employer was if you have a success, here's, here's how we do things here. If you have a success or a win, we like our employees to put out a general email to all staff because we like to celebrate our wins. So again, going back to culture, one of their pillars, you know, in their mission statement and vision statement was celebrate, celebrate our successes. What they also said was, however, what we're also very big on here is we understand that 
very few successes are gained individually because of the nature of the work that we do in this organization it's impossible for anyone to just do something single-handedly so what we also would like people to do is make sure that they give attribution to the people who supported them along the way to achieve whatever that win was so that was something that really has always stuck with me um and so I find that people don't like to be overlooked you know people like to be recognized and what I find in the Canadian workplace by and large notwithstanding every company has a different culture but that's really big here people like to celebrate in groups so by all means if you're the person who has been instrumental to that win of course from your own personal and professional branding development and i encourage every woman to be working daily minute by minute on their personal brand that's something to me that's non-negotiable by all means highlight your contribution to the organization's goals and objectives but make sure that you are highlighting and attributing to those people that helped you along the way so I think that's been a key a key a key thing for me that I always pass on to other people always and it should be continuous it's, it shouldn't be just at that moment in time it's that as you work alongside you know it's it's like when you grow up especially you thank you gratitude showing gratitude along the journey and not just at the highlights so then when it comes along it becomes so natural for you and I like when you talked about the personal brand and, and that to me talks about your own value, mm -hmm. your own what you bring to the table. So when you know your value and understand it, you're not going to be jealous of anybody else's value because that's what they're bringing to the table. My thumb, I can't, they can't be jealous. The pinky can't be jealous of the thumb because they both need each other to say, to do this. You know what I'm saying? Ex ex exactly. Exactly. You know, it's just so, you know, one of the things uh, one of my coaches has always said is, you need to toot your own horn because if you don't toot your own horn, no one on the road knows that you are coming. And so, and, and the other thing that she's always said is if it's your own work, you're not bragging because you did the work. Now, where it gets difficult or where it can cause problems is that you have instances, of course, in the workplace where people are taking credit for other people's work people are under recognizing other people's contributions and sometimes there's a lack of attribution that's where the problem stems from so it may not so much be jealousy and envy but more frustration and resentment because people feel that they are not valued and you know if you're going to get to a diverse inclusive and equitable workplace people at all levels need to have a sense of belonging well if you're doing great work and you're not getting recognized you're not going to feel like you belong so the whole thing is all interconnected intertwined it's all part of the same big equation I, I love that and you use some really key words there Jenny because when you talked about the culture of the organization I would say, you know, as we talk about the tips, understand the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. But I would say even as employers, you know, if, you, if you're an employee of, of one, two or a thousand people, what is the culture that you are fostering within your organization? Are you in fostering a, a culture of inclusion, you know, of real equity, what that really means and what diversity really means in the voices and how you celebrate and how you recognize and being cognizant of, of the community that you're building, but inside your organization, because it will spill over. And if you build a healthy culture in your organization, you will have healthy employees who will want to celebrate one another, who don't mind saying and celebrating, okay, I did well today, I did good today. And I think as women, if, if we can understand that, and if we learn how to continue to lift each other up and understanding that culture was such an important word and onboarding, what is that, on, as you get onboarded into an organization, how, what is that culture? Learn the culture, but you know, don't come at it at a combative way. How can I also myself um, in that space come and, and make that place an even more inclusive space and one where we are all celebrated. And if you want to, get treated well, treat another person well. You know, we teach each other how to treat yeah. each other. 
and, and don't retaliate because somebody treated you um, not the way that you should be treated. Stand in the truth of who you are. And that, that also becomes part of your personal brand. But that's, I think that's a topic, Donna. Donna's listening in the background there. Building your personal brand, what that looks like, having that value and, and how that feels. And so as we start winding down the conversation, you know, we talk about networks and support networks. Hmm. How do you build out those support networks in your organization? Yes. So again, I would say in that first sort of 30, 60, 90 days when you've joined the workplace, you know, you're going through induction. Now, you know, somebody, typically your your line manager has thoughtfully put together a group of people that they want you to meet. And so that's not a random exercise. You know, there's been a lot of thought that goes into, you know, it, we feel it's important for you coming in, in this role to meet person A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and so on. So that's really a useful place to start in terms of building relationships with those first people of contact when you come through those front doors. And then, of course, you're going to be meeting other people through projects that you do. Maybe there's some volunteer initiatives that happen within your organization. Maybe there's opportunities to be part of things like employee resource groups. There are many, many different avenues and opportunities to start to build those relationships. And so as you build those relationships, it, it then becomes very evident where those relationships are deeper than others and where you can get support. But the key thing I would say is a lot of the time we can get locked in our heads about, well, how can I get support and how can somebody help me? Always think of the other, the flip side of the coin in terms of how can I help others and how can I be a support to others and how can I be a valuable resource to others? Because one of the things that we need to always remember is that we also hold a lot of value and there's a lot that somebody can gain from us, uh, you know, in terms of us being allies in the workplace, in terms of us supporting other people. So I do see the whole thing as a two way exchange of value and benefit and that's how you optimize that relationship nobody wants to feel you know emotionally deprived or shortchanged because you know you're coming off as say a taker or somebody who is just self-serving us as human beings we pick up on that very very quickly and you know it, it can sour relationships and people withdraw so you know make sure that you're always thinking as you're going through that support network building exercise and relationship building exercise how can you help others now some people might say yeah but that person's a vp and i'm an individual contributor how can i possibly help them some really simple ideas maybe you saw an article on leadership and you can flip it to that vp there are, you know, there are ways of building relationships across all levels. Saw this article, thought that you might be interested. You know, I myself have done that a number of times and people have appreciated it. They're like, you know, thank you, Jenny. I didn't see this. So you're giving of yourself, you know, yeah. find ways to give back rather than just being the person who's just expecting all the time, you know, what can be done for me. Um, so that, those, those would be the, what I'd say on that, Nicole. I love that relationships and it's, it's legacy. When you, you recognize we're all here, not just for us. It's, it's about a community. It's about a world and each of us has a place and it's no man is an Island. And I love that when you see the bigger picture, when it's not just about you, me, 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 me. And when you start hearing somebody talking the I language, you know, there, there could be a problem. And if that person is you, I think we all need to sit every year in our lives and do that self-care audit, do that audit of how am I showing up? Am I being relational in the workplace? Because sometimes things may happen in workspaces or even on our personal lives that may make us even pull back or not share or share too much. And so I, I would encourage, as I hear you, I'm reminded to encourage not just myself, but others, do that personal audit, that personal audit of how am I networking? Am I sharing? And I love the article piece because I do that myself. Whether yeah. you're sitting in, you know, um, 
when we talk about allyship, one of the things that I, I did recently, and I've been doing like Black History Month, now it's Women's History, you know, Women's History Month, and let me remember this now, thank God you reminded me, Jenny, Women's History Month in the States is now, people, Women's History Month in Canada is officially in October, and then there's International Women's Day on the 8th, see, it's, but it's all about women, we're women, you know, 365 days of the year. However, just as we say that, you know, Black History Month just doesn't happen in one month, we're Black every month, we're women every month. And so when I find, especially, I, I like LinkedIn's, and LinkedIn is not mm. sponsoring this, maybe if anybody from LinkedIn is listening, maybe you want to be sponsor 100 ABC Women, our chats and our fireside chats, just saying that there. Because I sometimes I find, you can find an article there, and if you're connected in your network to people in your workplace, you can flip an article on this. Like I'm, I flipped articles like on, on different talks on DEI and stuff like that to individuals I know in that space who are interested. So it doesn't come like, oh, are you trying to tell me something? No, I just saw this article today. This person, this quote just stood out to me and, and make it something that's neutral, that, that is beneficial to the other person. So it, does, it doesn't look like you're trying to be higher up or you're trying to put hmm. a dig. You have to be very thoughtful as to your why you came i think earlier on you talked about your why mm -hmm. why is it important your why is also very key and um and one of the questions before i and that was i have some questions in the chat for you here one of my mentors said um he always asks this question what keeps you up at night if you ask a leader what keeps them up at night it's amazing the conversation that you would have even if you're doing an interview, it's a great question for an interview because it shows that it's you are more interested and also interested is as to what the other person is thinking. And it takes it all off about you and it becomes inclusive. Now, there's a question in the chat here, Jenny. Jenny, you have come um, from the United Kingdom. And if some of you don't know, that beautiful accent you hear there um, makes me wanna have a, some tea. Reminds me of the days when I lived in Wales, Jenny, but we'll talk about that offline. <laughs> I feel like I want to go to Marks and Sparks right now. And, um, and so do you see a difference between building allyship in Canada versus building allyship in the UK? That's a phenomenal question. I love that question. And so let me take it from a slightly different angle. And the angle that I want to take it from is the concept and the culture in Canada around volunteering. So in the UK, historically, volunteering is something that you do when you have retired, when your working life is at an end, then you go and do charity work, as it was called back in the day. Now, I've been out of England, to be fair, for, you know, not too short of 20 years. So I, I am out of date. So I want to caveat, you know, what I'm saying. So what I have found is because Canada has such a strong volunteering culture and is one of the top countries in the world when it comes to volunteer hours per annum, is a lot of the allyship that I certainly have experienced on a personal basis has come through volunteer. Because what I've noticed is in Canada, when you identify a gap, as I did with workplace representation for black female accountants, and then sought to do something about it, and you communicate that to other people, people applaud you, people yeah. support you. And, and I'm talking from all different backgrounds. Jenny, this is amazing. This is good for you. You know, there's so much support. So for me, that was a big cultural shift because, again, coming from uh, a regime at the time where, you know, you, you weren't doing volunteering alongside your day job. So I guess from that perspective, I've seen phenomenal, not me personally, the network and in my capacity as serving as part of the network has seen phenomenal allyship where people, like I mentioned, the meeting space availability, and there's so many other examples that the network has experienced. But the reason why it's so key is that it has transformed our members' lives, that, that type of action-oriented allyship. So that's why it's so powerful and that's why it always resonates with me. 
you know, you said something there when I, when you, the reason you started this network, which made me go, hmm, this field that you're in, at least I remember back in the day, and maybe it's still, still this way, is really male dominated, right? Hmm. And, and even if it isn't right now, but I still think it is, there's a perception that men are accountants. You, you know, you're not finding hmm. men in the field. And so if you, if we have, um, you know, we have adults listening in, if you know of a young person, what would you say, like, because we need to get them into the field. I think we need to get them into the field. What would you say to encourage them to get them into this field? And, and, and why? Exactly. So, you know, you're talking to somebody who finance and accounting is, is, and always will be my first love, even though I've moved into diversity, equity and inclusion, and I'm still very passionate about the accounting profession. I'm still a licensed CPA, keep, keep up all my uh, licenses and credentials. For me personally, it has been a career pathway that has just been incredibly rewarding in terms of who I am as a person and how I wanted to contribute in the workplace. So being somebody that supports the business, being a finance business partner, which was the field that the specialty that I had. So we have members who are in tax, audit, forensic, you know, all it, it, accounting is very multifaceted. For me, myself, it was financial planning and analysis, supporting business leaders, decision making processes. So for me, in terms of my strengths, how I wanted to show up in the workplace, it has been uh, incredibly rewarding. And so, you know, that's what I would say to to young women. And, and you know, we, we are very, very passionate about youth engagement. Um, it's, a, it's a strand that we are working on right now in the network. Uh, and certainly our director of youth engagement is hosting a, a youth summit uh, in, in the next couple of months. So it's something and, and, we're, and we're in partnership and collaboration with CPA Ontario and other provincial bodies, um, you know, in that stream. So it's the pipeline. It, it's it's the lifeblood of the profession. You know, you need people, uh, you know, coming through the profession with all their perspectives, all their ideas, all their creativity, all their innovation. So yes, we are constantly encouraging, um, you know, our our younger generations to to consider it as a career. And and you know, we do that in a number of ways. You know, our members will go and speak. You know, at at CPA events. Um, you know, make ourselves known, but then also to the youth, let them know that we're there because this is the power of having this collective. You know, one person can only get to so many places, speak at so many places. But once you have a collective, it just amplifies the voice. And so that platform is something that, you know, we are always trying to use to encourage uh, women in our community to, you know, definitely think think of it as a profession because they can join us. There's mentoring, there's tips, there's networking, developing your networking skills. You know, come and do it with us in a safe, non-judgmental space and be ready for the workplace. So it's a place where you can make those mistakes and, you know, goof up. But then when you get to the workplace, you're going to be a rock star. So that's that's the beauty of, of, of what we're trying to do within the network. I love that. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm getting another, I'm getting another thought, Donna. So be ready. I'm getting another thought because when I think about young women in particular, um, the history of money, the history of how we've been dealing with money as women, the older generation and bringing the older generation with the younger generation and having those conversations, but also teaching them now in a time when our young people are not really even being taught home economics mm. in school, it would really be a great place that, you know, um, learning about accounting and basic mm. accounting principles can help our younger generation to even be more empowered and teaching them it's not just numbers. You know, where, where, remember the, the thing, why when am I going to need math? You know, you, yeah. how can we make it more palatable to the young generation? So I really love that you guys have this member, this uh, mentorship that is that is going on in there. So now I'm looking at my time. I think I have six minutes. Yes, I have six minutes left. Okay, so we're going in still in the six minutes. I'm going to ask you a personal question here, there. 
um, what have you had to face as a woman in this world, in this male dominant world and this profession um, that really made you go, hmm, and how did you get over it? Like, what was that thing? You don't even have to name the thing, but how did you get through one of those most challenging times that you know it was because you were a woman that you were being pushed up against maybe the, the pendulum, the wall, the challenged by your intellect? Yeah, I'm trying to think of, a, of an example. Um... And you know what? Even if you don't remember hmm. the example, when you're faced with that, I, I should be fair. When you're faced with that hmm. as, as a woman and you're being challenged, what would be an advice that you can actually give to women when they're being challenged in that workspace? To, and especially black, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna even be more specific, the black woman, because I know I've gone in, you know, you don't mm. want to be the angry black woman because mm. one of the things that triggered that for me in thinking, Jenny, was when you talked about, you know, when you get cut off in a conversation, and sometimes I know as women, and I think as Caribbean women, as as women of African descent, and as African women, you know, when we get passionate, it can come across that we're angry, or sometimes our face may get serious because we're thinking, but because of what has happened in our past mm -hmm. we, it has been looked at when a woman a black woman appears like this she's angry but she's making a point how do you get through that angst when you're in those spaces and you need to get your point across and you're being considered that angry black woman well the interesting thing is you know as you progress through your career you know the way you may have handled something at the entry point mm -hmm. you know is not the same as when you are now endowed with more wisdom you know as you progress through life so that's that's one thing I think one of the things when I look back, I'm sort of going to answer it in a slightly different way in the sense that when I look back, one of the things that I always encourage women who are on the verge of entering the workforce, so undergrad programs, because people always say to me, what would you have told your 20 year old self if you had that time back? And one of those things is, you know, build your personal board of advisors even before you enter the workplace and one of the key ways in Canada that you can do that which is so so powerful is through volunteering mm -hmm. so you can, if, if you're in a volunteer space for instance if you take our network if you're someone who is still on an undergrad program but you're volunteering in our network you've now got access to VPs directors, senior managers who on a day to day basis, you may not have that access to just through the normal course of life. But because now you're all in the same space, sharing a common goal, working towards a common goal, it is the ideal place because somebody sees you contributing, they're going to help you. It's not it's not even it's going to be instantaneous that that they would help you. So when I think back to some of those situations where I think, you know, in hindsight, I could have handled it differently, but I realize maybe there was an absence of, you know, mentorship at that time or that support network, which is why I'm so evangelical about that with people who are entering the workforce or not yet coming in to build that because you've got somebody to bounce those things up. This is what is happening to me in the workplace. How best should I handle it? It's, it's, it, it's, I can't even explain it like it's priceless, you know, yeah. getting that insight from somebody who has walked that path doesn't have to be the same path, but just because they have that wider experience they can help you navigate and circumvent you know some of those uh, mistakes which when you're trying to sort of do that on your own it's never going to be um, as effective so that's really what I would say that when I look back probably some of the uh, decisions that I made earlier on in my career would have been different had I had mentors, um, you know, had I had those mentoring relationships. So that's something I always, always encourage um, others to do. Jenny, that, you know, I was going to ask you the question, what advice would you give to mature women and, and younger women? But I think this answered the question as well. Build your personal board of advisors. Like that right there is, you know, 
it's because it, people just look at mentorship as one thing and you only need mentorships in one part of your life. No. Building your personal board of advisors, people. I think uh, this was one, this is tweetable. This is a uh, call up the friend on the phone. This is what I heard today. Um, Jenny, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> Likewise, Nicole. Yeah, mentors at any point, at any stage in life, the earlier though, the better. And the reason why I give that tip about volunteering is that it's like a barrier free, easy access, immediate way of doing it. You know, find something that you are passionate about that also has like minded people involved at various levels. And honestly, you could be set for life. Because, you know, you've just got access in a way that you wouldn't have. You know, if you think about your workplace, you know, those same types of people might be there, but there's certain gateways. Oh, well, you have to book an appointment with so-and-so. Oh, so-and-so's calendar is, is busy six weeks out. You know, there are those natural kind of organizational barriers because of the seniority of that person. And you may never get the access. But as soon as you are volunteering in the same space, because that person sees you, sees that you're contribution, contributing to that mission and vision. It's it's like, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an open door. So that's something that I think is just so, so important for our community as well in particular. You hit the nail on the head. And uh, if I could call out all the comments in the chat, they're really good. Um, volunteering equals access and opportunity. Love it, Sarah. Um, it's not mere philanthropy and um an altruism and it's so true i know many of the opportunities i've gotten uh, is through volunteering yes. and when i look at 100 abc women in particular um you know it's a volunteer-led organization when i look at what you know donna denise and dr jean augustine have started it's all volunteer based honoring women and i think that is what is so powerful about international women's day i mean like if you listen to this discussion and i'm and i'm going to tell you now this hostess is going to get very emotional right now if you are going to do anything this international women's day this this month whether it's you're in the us whether you're in the uk whether wherever you are in the world listening to this i hope you can listen to the nuggets take the nuggets and and a lot about the the foundation i think was relationship relationship with yourself yeah. understanding yourself knowing your value but what is your relationships you're building with your with others the women in your space the allies in your space women and non-women who are those people and how are you building those, those relationships? Networking, networking, networking. And not just for what you can get out of it, but it's what you can bring to the bigger to the bigger table because it's not just about us. And I love, you know, as we approach it, we come into to get building that board of advisors because it helps us to be on the offensive and not approach conversations when they're defensive. I love how you answered the question about if you end up in a conversation and you reach angst, what can you do? And you said to me, and you said to us, it doesn't start there in that room. It starts on the outside. It's like a good football game. It's like a good soccer game. Yeah. You always start on the offensive so that when you're in there, you're not defensive. And that, my dear, has just like, yeah, sewed it up. I have here Sandra saying, Jen, you have a shared a new opportunity that volunteering can allow barrier-free access to mentoring. It it is bar none, and I know for absolutely, absolutely, Nicole. Sorry, I just want to just before we finish because I do want to. I'm so so. It, it warms my heart that the that the audience has picked up on that because that's something that I'm so evangelical about because, you know coming from a culture where why would you do why would you do stuff for free like you know coming from that cultural mindset and having to convince people close to me as to the importance of it because it wasn't something that they were used to they didn't understand it what you know why, why would you do all this for free I can honestly say from my own personal experience but then if you talk to some of our other past volunteer leaders and team members is we have all become better versions of ourselves through volunteering because it's that safe space not to just gain access to top people, but also to develop those things or those skills or those areas of opportunity which may not necessarily emerge in your day job. So, for instance, 
when I started, I had an inherent, inherent fear of public speaking. I remember volunteering for an organization out in the US, a finance related association. They were holding their inaugural conference in 2014. They wanted me to speak. You know, they invited me, Nicole. I turned it down. I was terrified. Now, BFAN was launched in 2016. And I had, again, personal board of advisors saying to me, Jenny, you've decided that you want to do this thing. Two things you need to get over yourself. You need to be able to speak with authority and confidence about this cause, about this platform. And you need to learn how to ask for help. So, you know, having that piece of really powerful mentoring, that was it. That's really what pushed me and got me on my public speaking journey. Before 2016, I, 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 I would never have done something like this. I, there, there's just no way. It doesn't matter if you were offering me a million dollars. I would not have done it. And that's because of the network. That, that, that You know, you find something that you're so passionate about because the cause really resonates with you at such a fundamental level. And you want to see it succeed, not just for yourself, but for others right and so it helps you to get over those mental or psychological but whatever it is that's holding you and saying oh, I can't do this so that's and and you know we've had members say Jenny I I, I never I, I didn't know how to chair a meeting before I you know I joined the volunteer team you know, didn't understand how to organize an event, didn't understand how to give a presentation because not because they didn't have the, the potential to do it, but maybe the roles they were in at work didn't allow for those professional development opportunities to uh, emerge. But here we are now in a volunteer space, gaining those skills that transfer right back into the workplace. So that's the other point that I really wanted to bring out. Sorry for, for cu cutting in. I just wanted to get that in. <laughs> Listen, comments are coming in on the volunteering piece. And I like what Daisy is saying. Daisy is also saying, we also must remember that our young generation, Gen Z and therefore it, they are also able to mentor us and we can learn from them as well. And we need to bring this into it. Um, Dorothy is saying, excellent kickoff to International Women's Day and inspirational discussion. Volunteerism is so important. And I want to encourage everybody on the line here. Listen, if you don't have this book, if you see it, 180 <laughs> women, maybe looking reverse to you, but you know what book this is, right? I would encourage you to buy one for yourself again and get one for a friend. Give one to an organization. This is a plethora of women in Canada that when I, when I first came on and read, I was like, where are these women? I never knew about these women and I've been living here for a long time. We can learn about great women like Jenny, like Donna Joan Simmons, like Denise, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green, the Honorable Do Dr. Jean Augustine, who have taken the time to start this so we can learn and honor women. It's not even about awards. And this is what I love about 100 ABC Women. We're not giving awards. We're honoring, see, we're honoring women for who they are and what they bring to the table and respecting one another and learning from one another. This is a great board of advisors. Let me tell you, if you want to meet a great board of advisors, come into this space and learn and give. And whatever we do with one another, do it with grace, give each other peace, give each other love, give each other kindness. And remember, every day looks different. Every day feels different. And victory looks different every day. I am Nicole Waldron here with the awesome. I want to call you Dr. Jenny. I don't know why. No, Jenny. I'm, like, no I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a Dr. Jenny. But like, the kind of information that you shared here today, it was like I was sitting down in this room with this expert, like a doctor. Like, you know, when you get to a doctor and you get some healing, I think you gave us some healing words today. So, Jenny O'Connor. Thank you so much for being our guest here today at the 100 ABC Women Fireside Chat. I thank everybody for listening. And please, if you found this conversation valuable, please share it with your network. I know I have learned a lot today. And I know I can see the hand claps coming up in our Zoom. You're on YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.
if you're listening on YouTube on the replay, put your comments in the chat. We go back and we read those comments and send us questions. It may stir up conversations for us for the next time. So take care. Happy Sunday. Happy International Women's Day. And if you're in the U.S., happy International Women's Month. And we got some time that we can plan something super califragilistic, espialidocious for October 2023 for International Women's Month in Canada. Take care. And we will see you next week for our conversation. Be sure to tune in. Bye. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. Look how far you have come on your own, but never alone. Through the rain and through the shine, here's your moment. Your day.